escape the nine to five and create your path to freedom. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to Screw the Cubicle TV. I am Lydia Lee, the freedom instigator at Screw the Cubicle. Thank you so very much for taking the time to join us for another conversation about living an unconventional life and getting the inspiration that you need for your own career reinventions and life transitions. So in today's series for the Corporate Escape Stories, I am so excited to interview Aaron Kelly, who you see with me here from Members Vault. Um, Aaron is the co-founder of Members Vault, a content platform that makes your free and paid content look straight up pro. She is currently living the digital nomad life in a 30-foot RV with her husband, her young son, and a rescue hound pup. That's a lot of people in one RV. That's great. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Sardines in there. Ah, yeah. It's like, I gotta talk to you about that story. Uh, but first, I also want to pick your brain on how you got started and how you, you've been experiencing a, a living an unconventional life. So thank Thank you, first of all, Erin, for joining me. You are not in an RV today, so you're with family. I'm not. Yeah. So one of the big reasons we did the RV thing is we were going to be able to travel all over and visit family. So we're staying for the holidays with my parents in Texas. So yeah. So it's it's a little weird to be in a house, but uh, <laughs> but but I like I like being able to take unlimited showers and not worry about yes. Space. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Nice. nice. Well, tell me more about your background, because, you know, a, a lot of what we want to talk about here on the series is sort of how people got started, you know, like what happened for you to even be like, I don't want to work in corporate anymore. I don't want to work for a nine to five sort of company. So tell us more about your background, how you sort of created your location independent business. Had, had it always been members fault? Where'd you get started? Yeah. So just the nutshell story is uh, I met my husband in New York City. We both were working corporate jobs. I was working for Disney. Uh, publication. So very, very, very corporate, very cubicle dweller. Um, and, and I loved it, but I just realized I hated the red tape. I hated the long hours. I just, you know, we wanted to get out of New York city. Um, and so we actually started a web design business and this was like eight, nine years ago that we did that. Um, and it has allowed us to kind of explore different interests that we have, uh, try out different things that, that kind of intrigue us, um, while still paying the bills. And uh, so we traveled all over. We lived in a yurt in the mountains of Southwest Virginia for a wow. while. We did the homesteading thing. Yeah. Um, and then we moved to the Pacific Northwest. And that's when I really, this is like two and a half, three years ago is when I really got into the OBM business. So online business manager, for people that aren't mm -hmm. aware of that. So basically, I'm like the second uh, you know, pair of eyes, the right-hand person uh, for entrepreneurs. And uh, booked solid, did really, really great with that. Loved doing it. And through my OBM business, um, we actually came up with the idea for Member Vaults for one of my clients who was not happy with the tools that were available. Mm. And so my husband's a web developer, and so he's like, I can do something better. Like, I can build it. And so we did a custom app for this client, and just, it's exploded. It's, it's gotten so much interest, and so it has really blown up from there to the point where I don't take OBM clients anymore, and I've pretty much phased that whole side of my business out. Wow. So you started as an OBM because that's something that you sort of knew how to do from back in the day or did you have to reskill yourself or upskill yourself in order to do yeah. that? Yeah. So a lot of the skills that I, you know, I was a communications major in college. So like a lot mm. of the skills that I knew, the PR, um, the web development, graphic design, um, writing eBooks, you know, all of that stuff really came into play for the OBM side, you know, being able to do that for my clients. Um, so really all of my experiences led to making me a really fantastic OBM for people. Well, I love that your story isn't like, you know, a lot of people start to, to get a bit of a panic when they, they think they have to choose the perfect business idea, right? When they first take that leap and they're like, yeah. what should I do? It's the thing that I die with. It's like, you know, it's like this big question. <laughs> yeah, I'm stuck, stuck with it. Yeah. I'm just stuck, you know? And, and I, and my story is the same, like screw the cubicle was not the first business I started. You know, it was mm -hmm. actually a, almost like a transition business. It was an old industry. I knew how to do that, had context in it already. It was an easy start. Uh, and I think that most people that will take the leap a little bit more successfully are very likely people that are repurposing right their skill sets and then just yeah. making it to something sort of new um, yeah. now starting with the OBM business before we get into members vault like where did you find your first client as an OBM did you go online like go into Facebook groups and look for clients what was sort of your first like traction that you received from from yeah, uh, being so, the business owner? yeah so my very first client who then became my biggest client uh, was Adrian Dorison and she oh, I was know. my business coach. Yeah, she was my business coach at the ah. time. And I was like, I'm thinking about becoming an OBM and this is the reason, you know, these are the reasons why I think it's a good fit. And she was like, well, I'll be your first client if you decide Amazing. to do that. So, 
So I was like, okay, talk about pre-validating. Uh, and so it was very quickly thereafter. I mean, it was, I think that the OBM business specifically is really great word of mouth mm. and don't take that many clients. So you book yourself up very quickly. And so just people that Adrian recommended me to, uh, clients that were working with Adrian, they wanted to hire me. And that's how it happens. Mm. And so through being an OBM, you did that for a couple of years, I, I assume. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then you started to see a different problem that was happening in that, in the digital marketing or coaching industry. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's sort of how Members Vault was born. And you sort of went down that rabbit hole. And now you do that full time with your mm -hmm. hubby. Uh, so what is Members Vault? Tell us a bit more about how you make a living with that business. And how did you get started with that? Like, did you end up testing a bit? You said you tested a bit with Adrian, I think, was it? Mm -hmm. That you did that sort of beta test uh, uh, software or platform with? And then how did you sort of find a market for that product? Yeah, so it's really kind of a funny story. I was very resistant to creating a business out of Member Vault because I was like, you know, it's a lot of work. I told my husband, I'm like, it's a lot of work. It's not just build it and they'll come. Like, you got to do all the marketing. You got to do all of the audience building. Um, and so I was like, this is a great, I'm glad that we did this. It's great for Adrian, but I don't think that we're going to create a business. We had so many people coming to us that were clients of Adrian's that were like, I love this platform. Like, how do I, how do I sign up? And so uh, my husband just kept fighting for it, fighting for it, fighting for it. And finally, uh, enough people came and wanted to, you know, sign up as users that I was like, okay, this is something that we should really like mm. move forward with. So we basically started doing like a beta launch of Member Vault where we really looked at how people were using it. And that is when it transitioned from a course platform to a content platform. So you can put your opt-ins in there. You can put your paid offers in there. You can, people put their webinars in there. I mean, you can put anything in there, video, audio, text. Yeah, no, it's so powerful. And then the big thing is that it connects to your email service. So it tags people as they complete content. Wow. So you, can, so you can send triggered emails. You can showcase stuff that's available and it has teaser content so that you can tag them when they check out stuff and they're interested in maybe buying it or signing up for it. Uh, so yeah, I mean, his, it's really, it's a continuing evolution as we watch how people use it. And I just, I, I totally geek out to all of the stalking strategy stuff yeah. um, because of my OBM background. So it's right. really cool. Yeah, so yeah. You, you've, you've still utilized a lot of your OBM experience yeah. to do this yeah. business. I love that it, it all links, right? It's not completely different ideas that are, that are sort of irrelevant, you know? Um, I, I love that you also took the time, I think, to understand problems, which I think a lot of people don't do uh, in the beginning when they first launch a business. It's, you know, they, they sort of go, this sounds good. Someone else is doing that, and I'm just going to be that. I want to be a web designer. I want to be a writer. Uh, and, and then they feel that they are, um, there's, you know, they'll feel like an imposter syndrome that happens sometimes where mm -hmm. they're like, oh, so many other people doing it. Why me? Uh, and, and I've always suggested like, well, find out which problems you really solve. It, it, like that title of being a writer or being a web designer, it's just a title, but it's how you do your work and sort of what you do differently that makes a difference. So what has been your process to sort of improve Members Vault to be um, the go-to tool, right? For people to, yeah. to utilize for their digital business. Did you do like surveys? Did you have a small group of like a cohort that tested the first version first and then, you know, found out the data and re reinvented the, the, the platform? How, how did you go about doing that beta testing phase? Yeah. So I honestly think this is the best advice for any business. So it's not specific to member vault, but it's just talking to people. So yeah, actually good old fashioned conversation. Right? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I'm an, I'm an introvert. So Doing right. phone calls really drains me. I have to really watch my energy. And yet mm. that is the best way to not only understand where you're kind of like missing the mark, but also like those little hidden gems where people are like, I really love this thing, um, which is actually how the email tagging came about was like, mm. yeah, sort of like a glimmer. It was like a little side shoot idea where I was like, this would be really cool if you could do it because I'm really big into email marketing. And we did like just a tiny little taste of it and people got so excited they were like, okay, like we need to really go whole hog into this. Um, and so, yeah, I don't think that we would have evolved it to where it is right now if we hadn't gotten on the phone with people and really talked about like, how are you using it? You know, what do you like about it? Why is it better than what you were using before? All of those things. I mean, it's just invaluable data. Yeah, it's so funny, isn't it? Sometimes it's the most simplest thing that we need to do to get to the answers, but we're so caught up, I think, in the digital world of like, no, I need to have this perfect funnel and this copy and this Facebook ad and like leaving it to the machine to do all mm -hmm. our relationship building when very, in the reality of the world is that w you can't automate intimacy, can you? <laughs> you can't, that. That is, that's a quotable right that's there. A quotable, yeah. right? You can't automate intimacy, especially I think people in service-based businesses like an OBM business, for example, mm -hmm. even members vault is very humanized right it's not just a SAS sort of you know tool that no you never talk to anybody you know and I think that mm -hmm. that's what makes it different is that you and your husband are available 
for people to speak to. Um, talking about service-based providers, um, a, a lot of people that, that watch this channel and, and come to Screw the Cubicle, uh, the first question they always ask is, how do I know what niche to focus on, right? I've got all these different skills, just like you know, you did at Disney, you have multiple communications, mm -hmm. PR, da 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 da. And, and how do you focus on a niche? What has been your uh, experience uh, around finding your focus if you have been someone that is skilled at sort of multiple things, you know, multi passionate, potentialite, multi potentialite, whatever the, the term is, these right, right, um, whatever the phrase, yeah. all right? What would you, what's your advice for someone that just goes, has a lot of tools to use, but need to build a business that's a little bit more focused so they can find the right customers for their business? Yeah, so I'm going to repeat myself here and say actually talking to people. So right, good. when I really was considering doing the OBM business, you know, I obviously I talked to my business coach. That was my first client. And then I started pre-validating um, in Facebook groups where I would post something very, very specific. Like, I want to get on the phone and talk to you about this problem. You'll get, you'll benefit from it because of this. Mm -hmm. um, and I won't take up more than like 15 minutes of your time, right? And those, those booked up so quickly because it was really specific. Um, it wasn't just like, oh, get on a phone call with me to do a copy chat. It was like, Let's jam out about this one thing that you have. Um, and those calls really, you know, in your head, especially as us, like as, as really passionate entrepreneurs, um, we have all these ideas, right? Well, I could do this and I can do this package and I could offer this and I could offer this, right? And um, when you get on the phone with people and you actually talk about what they're struggling with, it really focuses all of that down. You're like, okay, I don't need all of this fluff. I don't need all of these packages. I just need to focus on this one thing. Um, and you know, honestly, like that's the best pre-validation because they want to hire you. Yeah. And then as you work with them, you will evolve your packages and your offers and your niche and all of that stuff. I think that's such a good point that it is so true that business evolves with you, right? What you start doing may not be what you end up doing because you evolve as a human and therefore right. your business very likely evolves with you. Um, I, and, and you're right. There's so much um, uh, common themes, right? That can happen when you talk to, let's say five or 10 people, where you start to see the same issues happening and you go, that maybe should be the, the niche. Not, it's just not about what I think I should do, but it's like what the market also needs and how can I infuse my other skill sets? Because I think uh, we don't need to be one trick ponies. It's not just being a, a writer and also a techie person. It can be both, right? That's what makes right. you different, isn't it? When you combine your mm -hmm. skills, but have a core focus of what problem that you solve that people actually demand to buy, right? Which is really, really right. So real conversations is the message of the day. Start getting human. Absolutely. <laughs> Start getting human yeah. about your business. And not relying on the, yeah. yeah, it's not relying on the internet or social media just to do the work. Um, I, I love that you jumped on calls in the beginning too, because I did the same. You know, I didn't know actually what around um, uh, coaching that I wanted to, to focus on. Uh, and I did a 30 for 30 trade. It was sort of like 30 minutes of me picking your brain about what the hell's going on? What's keeping you up at night? To, and then you get 30 minutes of my time to ask me anything and I can give you my best advice being a corporate escapee, right? And that was really great because it felt like an exchange. It wasn't mm -hmm. just an ask. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's an excellent uh, lesson for first-time entrepreneurs to start get, uh, to get going anyway. Yeah, so I love that. How, long it, how long has it been for you since you've left uh, corporate? So it has been about eight years since I left corporate. Wow. Um, okay. Yeah, it's like, I haven't woken up to an alarm clock and I don't even know how long ago, eight years. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine going back. Well, there must be some like amazing experiences you've had in eight years, but also the hurdles, right? Cause we, we, you know, I don't want to only talk about, oh, we made it and we're great and we're doing this. We don't have right. to wake up with an alarm clock. We have, you know, there's so many ups and downs when it comes to choosing this unconventional path because there is no SOP. <laughs> Mm -hmm. right? yeah. There's no like, do this, then this and that. Um, and, and so you've had to figure out your own path. So what do you think like you've had to learn in the last eight years uh, that has allowed you to continuously grow your business and also live this life, not only with yourself, but with your husband, uh, with your dog, with your, with your child? Um, mm -hmm. What have you learned uh, and, and what do you think would be really beneficial for people to sort of know now? So what would you have told yourself eight years ago yeah. you know, of what yeah. you would say? That's a great question. So I would say that getting comfortable with being uncomfortable is kind of a requirement of being an entrepreneur because there's a lot of unknowns. Um, and, and now that I've been doing this for so long, I think that you actually have more job security as an entrepreneur than you do when you're in a nine to five because you have lots of different clients. You have like that like pipeline of, of potential income that you can like ramp up if you need to, right? Mm -hmm. um, and where, where you're in a nine to five, like the company might not be doing well and you don't know. And then you get laid off the next day. Right. So everyone always thinks like, Oh, if you're working a nine to five, like you have all the stability, but I actually think it takes a lot of control out of your hands. 
Um, but in the beginning, that was really hard. And I, I will say even now, like, you know, switching from a successful OBM business where I was easily, you know, making over 10 grand a month and could easily ramp it up even more if I wanted to, um, to a fledgling business where it's like not proven yet. And we, we are doing really well and it's better. Every month is better, but it's like, you know, that was a big jump and that really had to be, I had to be comfortable with being uncomfortable and, and just saying, we'll, we'll make it work. Like whatever happens, we'll be able to flex and we'll be able to yeah. evolve and make it work. Yeah, there's, I mean, a self-reliance that has to happen, but I think it comes with experience, isn't it? I mean, even in my story, there's been so many times I've been in the hole, you know, like in, in the beginning few years of my business. And every time that I have to get myself out of the hole, I realize something more about myself, you know, what I was capable of, what I could rely on myself for. And, and yeah. it never happens to the worst case scenario of being homeless or whatever you think has to happen. Because ultimately, <laughs> I think that, you know, you could always go back and get a job if necessary. You could freelance and do something on Upwork, you know, if, if it's yeah. necessary to pay the bills. Uh, so you're right. It's, it's so much about the mental thing, isn't it? Of what, how we see, you know, what is right or wrong and what we think we need. Job security, another, uh, uh, for sure, I, I experienced this as well myself where I was making a six-figure uh, income and going, I need to replace that income completely in order for me to even be allowed to quit. Ex except that I didn't really calculate what I was actually bringing home, like after 40% tax and the yeah. amount of hours I was actually working to get that money, I was actually making less than my assistant. Like, you know, you don't, you right, don't you right. think about yeah, it. Like, six figures. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so we have to really um, uh, logically look at things, but also really think about it as like the worst case scenario, we can absolutely still fend for ourselves, especially if you're from the first world, you have an education, you've got experience, yeah. like really you have nothing to lose. So mindset is quite a big piece of it. Um, so you said to me before that mindset is at least like 70% of the battle, right? For leaving the nine to five. Uh, mm -hmm. What sorts of mindset shifts do you think people need to um, um, uh, develop as they, as they transition? Uh, and what's the other 30% that they have to also be focusing on? Um, I would say that letting go of attachment to what you have right now. So like what you were saying where you're like, I have this idea that I'm a six figure like corporate earner. And so I have to match this perfectly to be able to, you know, leave what I have now. And I think that it's really accepting that your new reality might look different and you know, you might not earn as much immediately, but you'll have all of these other things. And so right. really really being open to the possibilities of, of that being even better. Um, you know, letting go of that, like attachment to, um, a label, you know, all of that good mm. stuff. I think that that's really valuable. Um, in terms of the, the other 30%, I think it's being willing to push your comfort zones and hustle if you have to. So, yeah. um, you know, comfort zones is still kind of mindset, but I think that a lot of times people will just like sit in the fear and they'll sit in the like unknown and they're like, ah, okay, I have to go back and take, get another job because I can't make this work where mm -hmm. really if they would just push themselves a little bit more and it is, it's, it's uncomfortable for everyone. Like it is. You know, some people make it look really easy, but I guarantee that there was points that they hit really uncomfortable, totally. scary things that they had to push through. So mm. knowing that it's the same for everybody. Yeah, and I think everyone started where everyone started, right? So it's, it's, of course, it's easy on Instagram and Snapchat or whatever it is these days to show that really beautiful life. It's like, especially, you know, the whole digital nomad movement. It's like you only see people on laptops at a hammock on a beach. And, and I'm just like, that's so not my days at all. Like, I actually have to hunker down to launch things and then take vacations, like, strategically, not actually all day, every day, because to build anything very likely, I think uh, the reality is that you, you're likely going to be working harder than you've ever worked before because you're learning new things. Your mm -hmm. past resume doesn't matter anymore in this realm. You know, it's about your tenacity mm -hmm. and your perseverance to continue and figure out the solutions. And I think uh, that's so important to, to talk about because I think when people come into this um, notion of like, I want to be a digital nomad. You know, I want to be location independent. They just think it's like, I can just be on my laptop all day and then also be at the beach. But uh, the, mm. the fact is that there's so much of a learning curve of like getting digital, finding your first client, building your website, whatever it is that needs that time of focus, you know, mm -hmm. that, that, that we need to actually take it seriously. It is another job, you know, it's not a holiday and, and hopefully yeah. we're all picking work that we, we, we love so that it doesn't feel like work as much because you are. Right, right, right. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. I've worked way harder now than oh, I yeah. ever did. Corporate, yeah. but I love it. So it's okay. Like I like working, you know, if I have to do something at night, um, when my husband's putting our little kid down, um, 
I'm happy to do it because it's it's pushing the needle forward in in a way that makes me really happy. So it's mm. okay. Whereas like if I was doing that for you know a nine to five job where I, I didn't matter, it wasn't I wasn't seeing any impact on the bottom line sure. uh, for me. Like that would feel really grueling. Whereas instead, it feels very empowering. Mm, yeah, you get to reap the benefits of every piece of effort that you put into your business, which I mm -hmm. love as well. Uh, well, let's talk about this lifestyle choice you've you've decided on, uh, because a, a lot of people do have this interest in uh, going location independent, minimalizing their life, simplifying their life, uh, and and just not be attached so much to that picket fence home or that mortgage or you know the things that sort of keep us stuck sometimes financially in our positions mm -hmm. instead of actually getting out there and doing the thing. Uh, so you've decided to, to live in this 30 foot RV with your husband, your son and your pup, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and it is taking family on the road difficult. Like, is this a conversation that you have to discuss with your husband beforehand? How did you come to the conclusion that it's going to benefit your life to take your family <laughs> on the road and sort of how has that changed the way you, you live and work now? Yeah, so I think we actually talked about it for around three years before we before we ended up really going for it um, because we had done the really like alternative lifestyle where we lived in a yurt and we heated it with a wood stove and we did the home setting. We were like out in the middle of nowhere. And so we were like, okay, is this really going to make us happy or is it just like a pipe dream kind of like it looks really good on paper or Instagram mm. and we're going to be miserable because it is a big jump. I mean, we had to, yes. we were renting, we didn't have to sell our house, but we did have to sell most of our belongings. Um, and you know, there's all the issues and you're very familiar with this, but like, doing a virtual mailbox and like doing all those things. And it's actually very disorienting, like not having a physical address, like whenever you have to do a prescription or um, something of that sort and people ask for your address and you're like, oh, like, you know, so that was like a weird transition. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of friction to get to actually doing the digital nomad thing and living in a trailer and traveling around um, the U S. So uh, we talked about it for about three years and then eventually we were like, okay, our lease is almost up. Like we, our kid is the right age. He was, he was about to turn one. We were like, now, now is the time to do it. Like before he goes into school and all that. So mm. just made the leap. And has it been a, uh, has it been a struggle to raise a one-year-old on the road? Was there like, it, was it uh, less than what you thought it would be? Or did you have to sort of re find different resources to, uh, with other families that also travel on the road to really understand what's the safe places to go and, you know, making, making sure that you have access to all the resources that you require? Yeah, so it's, it's actually been really fantastic. He's met so many people, um, so many of the campgrounds that we've stayed at, like the host fall in love with him. Like he got birthday gifts from the campground that we were at when uh, when he actually turned one wow. um, and they yeah they would like had a sticker book just for him when we would go up to the office to get our packages I mean so it's been that actually has been really cool that was something that I was worried about um, it has been more difficult as he's gotten older and he's dropped more of his naps um, because there's less work time um, so we basically do like part-time part-time uh, right. where you know my husband watches him and then I watch him uh, so it was easier when he was a little bit younger um, but overall, I think that having him on the road has been one of the easier things to do. Uh, one of the hardest things has been laundry. Um, right. Because, oh, yes, of course. <laughs> right? Uh, you know, the laundromats at these campgrounds are terrible. Mm. And so, you know, working it around uh, call schedules, nap schedules, the laundromat schedule, and then, of course, I feel like the dryers never work. So you always end up having to, like, run it, like, three times, um, you know, and it's like the laundromat's about to close. You've got to be making dinner. And, right. you know, that, those are the things that you don't know about when you make these leaps into unconventional lives. So it's like laundry is the, big, the bane <laughs> of my existence. Like, I'm loving being in a house right now where I can just go to a working washer and dryer and know that it's going to be available. Um, and, yeah, it totally has simplified that. Yeah. I mean, you, it's, everything has pros and cons, isn't it? There's an exchange for every experience that we have and you never really know until you get there. But, uh, and, and you're thinking short term, aren't you? It's like, it's not like you're being an RV forever, right? As you said, it's like the right time for right now. And later on, you may actually have a house again and have schooling in a neighborhood and you know, like that, that and, and that can change with you and you don't have to make any conscious decisions about it right now, but having the flexibility, I think, right. To make those decisions whatever yeah. they see, uh, where, however you see fit is, I think, a, a great blessing and, and, and what we have to be have gratitude about, I think, being entrepreneurs, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. And it's that correlation to what you said about you're not stuck in one business idea. Like mm. you can evolve it. So your life is the same way. Like if you okay. try something and you don't like it, or if you try something and you like something better, you can evolve it. You can change. You can, 
um, you know, experience all of these different things. Mm, absolutely. And on that note, that's a great way to end the interview. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your story because I love actually bringing people because, you know, people think the digital nomad life is reserved for like millennials and single people. And, you know, and, and you know, that is easier. It's true. You know, I'm not going to lie about that when you don't have a huge family to take with you. Uh, but so I'm so glad that you, you, you shared, you know, that you did it uh, in, in a way that is truly unconventional and you didn't go abroad. You stayed local, right, in America and did your own mini adventure in your own country, right, mm -hmm. which is sort of a nice little inch. And maybe next year it's Bali to visit me, uh, you know, <laughs> and wherever that is. But you sort of have these little tasters in the year to yeah. this, you know. Uh, yeah. And I think that's such, such, a, such an amazing thing to not let this, um, uh, you know, old traditional way of raising family to stop you, right, from making up your own rules, about what's good for your family. And I bet you have received like amazing experiences being able to be closer really to your family as well, being yes. stuck in a 30 yes. foot trailer, right? Oh, like it's giving oh, you a different time. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> a, new, a new love uh, for space. Yeah. <laughs> a new comfort for sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, how, where can people find you if they want to learn more about Members Vault, they want to learn more about your adventures with your family, uh, where can they find you in the digital realm? Yeah, so uh, they can go to membervault.com or .co, uh, so no M, and uh, they can also go, we are on Facebook under Member Vault. Um, we occasionally post on Instagram. I will admit that I am not as good as I should be. Um, and so they can definitely see uh, pictures about our journey and learn more about Member Vault. Uh, we do have a free account so people can test it out uh, and see if it works for their business. Perfect. Thank you so very much for coming on the show today. And we'll put the links up for, uh, for Aaron. You can find her anytime. And uh, member, I, I also have access to Members Vault. I have actually <laughs> signed in before and it looks amazing. So thank you very much for putting your effort in there for all, our, all the digital owners out there that need this platform as well. <laughs> Thanks, thank Aaron. You. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. Have you been desiring to create a life and career that gives you the freedom that you deserve, but you're not quite sure where to start? Well, let me be the guide to help you quit that job that's crushing your soul, discover your strengths, and make money doing something that you love and will care about. Head over to screwthecubicle.com to find tools and resources I've created just for you to help you jumpstart your escape plan from your nine to five and launch a business you can run from anywhere.